Well, what a weekend so far it's been. One of the greatest things about yesterday for myself was, uh, you know, I, I try to hand out tons of those invites to the harvest party, and then you just see one person that comes and you go, I gave you an invite. And I wonder, wonder whether that was me or whether that was just someone else or whatever. But I'm just so, I was so excited yesterday. It was so busy. It was crazy. There was so many people here. But boy, it was exciting. It was so good. So I'm, I was excited about yesterday. And here in the 750, I was speaking to Elder Don this morning. He said, we can't fit any more in this church after that. <laughs> so, you know. But what a great thing to be able to say that we opened up our church to the community and able to do that. So. Fantastic. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 11 today is the reading. Um, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the ex excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Pastor. All right, you may be seated. <clears throat> we like to stand up for the scripture reading, but you can sit down for the preaching. That's, you're welcome. That's right, yeah. I mean, I'm going to stand for the preaching, but no, nah. all right. I, uh, I uh, have already, this service has already been such a blessing. I, um, I just love this church and being a part of it and, and all of you. And I um, thank you for the privilege of letting me be the pastor. Um, today, we're going to talk <clears throat> about one of my absolute favorite subjects, and that is Thanksgiving. And I don't mean the holiday, although Thanksgiving, you, you can make the argument that, that Thanksgiving is one of the most Christian holidays, actually. Um, and that's kind of a big statement, but, I, but I'll tell you this, I, I, I love, I do love the holiday of Thanksgiving, but I love the principle of it. I love um, this, this whole idea of gratitude. Um, we had a lot to cover this morning. Um, I want you, if you still got your Bibles open to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to look at some more of that in a moment. But I want you to see, so Pastor Jamie read that verse for us, and this is one of these verses that over and over in my life, God has used this portion of scripture to help me. We're going to unpack it a little bit. It's a very deep text. We're going to only hit the top of it this morning. But I want you to see what it says. Look again with me at verse 7. I'm going to pray in a moment, but look at this first. Verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power might be of God, and not of us. We are not necessarily that impressive. You, the world sometimes can seem a very big and very scary place because it is both very big and very scary. And we can seem very tiny and very insignificant in the scheme of things. It's good for you every so often to go out into the country somewhere away from the city at night and look up at the stars and remember how very, very small we are and how very great and how very excellent God is. Amen. And then to think that God would put some of that treasure inside of you. That explains verse 8, we are troubled on every side. And we know that's true. That's true for everybody. You could call that life. Troubled on every side. But for the Christian, there's a wonderful comma and then something else. There's a but there. Oh, Christian, do you have troubles? Yes, but how wonderful is that? Do you have difficulty? Yes, but we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, 
but not in despair. Persecuted, yeah, but not forsaken. Cast down, sometimes, but not destroyed. How is that accomplished? Verse 10 tells us, we are always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in the flesh. Signs of life, amen? That's why I always tell the parents, I do not mind crying babies in church, not even a little. Signs of life, amen? You know what the worst thing for a church is? When there's never any crying babies in church. Praise the Lord. Always bearing about the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest. For we are always delivered, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then the Bible says, death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according to it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing, knowing, verse 14, see this, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. The same power. that spangled the heavens with stars. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is a treasure that's held in earthen vessels, literally in jars out of clay. The humblest, least impressive, cheapest pottery imaginable. Jars of clay, vessels made out of the earth. And this unbelievable treasure has been placed into those jars of clay. And we know that the same power that raised up Christ is going to transform those containing vessels. That's you and me. You and I, we're the jars of clay. We're the, we're the vessels, we're the containers made out of earth. We're made out of dirt. That's not flattering, but it happens to just be true. Yeah. And when somebody dies, eventually they just turn back into what they were made out of, which is dirt. This isn't in my notes, but uh, I heard about the Sunday school boy. He came home from Sunday school and he said, mom, today we learned that God made people out of dirt and that when we die, we go back to dirt. Is that true? And mom said, yeah, that's true. And he said, well, I just looked under the couch and somebody's either coming or going. <laughs> But that's what we are. We're, we're, we're earthy people. We're made out of dirt and dust. And what, and if the Bible didn't say it, you, you, you almost couldn't believe it to be true. That the eternal God would put the treasure of his power in, in earthen vessels like us. But I want you to see then verse 15. For all things are for your sakes. All this trouble, all the perplexion, all the persecution, all the casting down. God doesn't allow it because he's indifferent. He doesn't suffer us to go through these things because he doesn't care or he wants to watch us squirm. No, the Bible says that it happens for your benefit. It's hard to understand it. We are perplexed about these things. But the Bible says it's for your sake. It's for your well-being. It's for your eternal benefit. Why? Look at what it says. That the abundant grace, the abundant grace of God might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. As we begin to grasp a hold of these things, even a little bit, it produces a spirit of thanksgiving. How do I know that? Because that is what God has been doing in my life. The more I am troubled but not distressed, the more I am perplexed but not in despair, the more I am persecuted but not forsaken, the more I am cast down but not destroyed, the more conscious I become of the treasure that is carried around in a jar of clay. 
the more I'm aware of the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ and bearing my own cross and following him, the more excited I become for the resurrection of Christ that I get to participate in. And it produces not only just not despair, it produces thanksgiving. And that redounds, it it ends up for the glory of God. Verse 16, for the which cause we faint not. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. No matter how badly things are going outside, whatever is happening here, the inner person, the real you, can experience renewal every single day. Today's this two-part series on thankfulness. Today's part one. Of all the Christian disciplines, I really believe that thankfulness has had the biggest impact on my life. We know the three Christian virtues, faith, hope, and love. But underneath the virtues, there are what we call the Christian disciplines. Kindness. It's a discipline to be kind. Generosity. Forgiveness. Compassion. Witnessing. And you make a list of the Christian disciplines. But I'd say that there's something about thankfulness. It's a discipline. It's a choice. It's not just something, well, I'm a thankful person or I'm not a thankful person. Like any other of the dis- Christian disciplines, it's something that you choose or not. And there's something about thankfulness that God has used over and over dramatically in my life to help me see victory in areas that I think I would have been defeated in. And I'm excited to share these things with you this morning. Would you join me just in a word of prayer? God, we bow our heads one last time here before this message and Lord, just beg of you your help. God, these things are too big and too wonderful for me. These are your people. They're here to hear from you. God, as we read your word, I pray that you would speak clearly to every life and heart. Help us to get a hold of this. Help us to be changed people. Instill this level of gratitude and thankfulness into our hearts. We pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you've got your bulletin and you want to follow along, we'll fill some blanks in here as we go along. I've preached on thankfulness kind of regularly because I love it. Uh, So some of you will have heard some of these things before, but we're going to come at it at a slightly different angle a little bit this morning. First, I want to talk about the key principle here. The key principle that's at stake is being thankful versus being unthankful. And I would say to you this morning that it is a choice that you get to make. And furthermore, I'd like to say to you this, that unthankfulness is extremely dangerous. This is not just a matter of, well, it's better to be thankful and it's worse to be unthankful. I would say to you, in fact, if you look at your Bibles, if you look at the world around you, you will see quite clearly that when we choose to be unthankful, that when we fail to be grateful for things, we are engaged in extremely dangerous behavior. Romans 121 puts it like this. It's the descent of a society and and every culture in the world has followed exactly what Romans says. Uh, Nations rise and fall, cultures rise and fall. And as they fall, they fall according to the pattern of Romans chapter one. And it goes like this, Romans 121. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful It starts out, people know about God, but they decide they don't want God. So they're going to have other gods. They're going to do something other than that. And what is the very first sign of a culture that has turned its back on God? Unthankfulness. The murder and the violence and the assault and the abuse of children and the greed and the corruption comes later. Those are all consequences of turning your back on God. But the first one is a gratitude failure. And then they became vain in their imaginations 
and their foolish heart was darkened. How do, how do societies, how do families get so broken where they're doing things that are clearly against their own interest? Why are we doing all of these things that are obviously harming ourselves and our kids and our families? I mean, who does this? It happens because their hearts are darkened, because their brains don't work right anymore. Do you see that around us? That it's like the, our brains don't work right anymore. People can't think straight anymore. What is going on? I'll, I'll tell you that it started when they said, we don't want God anymore, and they stopped being thankful. That's why unthankfulness is a sign of the last days. You go, look, one of the key signs of the end of days, whether the end of days of a nation or a culture or the end of days, 2 Timothy 3, know that in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. I want you to know also that complaining leads to destruction. 1 Corinthians 10.10 10 says, don't murmur. Murmuring is a dripping, continual complaining. The Bible says, don't murmur. As some of them murmured, and they were destroyed of the destroyer. It's a reference to number 16. The people began to just complain out in the desert. Just, I don't like the food, and I don't live in Egypt, and Moses never does, and he doesn't do what I tell him to do, and drip, 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 drip. God opened up the ground and swallowed them. Not, not for the idolaters. Not for, not for the liars. I mean, terrible sins. But God got so tired of the murmuring, he had the earth eat them. Go read it. Complaining, complaining leads to destruction. Unthankfulness is dangerous. And it's not just that. On the other side, we have thankfulness, of course. And thankfulness, I would tell you this, is a hallmark of spiritual maturity. See, there, there are things that mark out somebody as spiritually mature. But I'll tell you, one of the early, most visible things, and I see this as a pastor, and, and the Bible says it more importantly, but I'll tell you that when somebody's really growing in the Lord, when someone's really growing as a Christian and walking with God, one of the visible things that you will see is they become more and more thankful. Colossians 2, 7 says, we are rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as we've been taught and abounding therein with thanksgiving. The hallmark of a Christian that is established in the faith and growing is that they abound with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is God's will for your life. You say, what's God's will for my life? I'll tell you one part of it. See, you'd be thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Thankfulness is a vital component of prayer. Philippians 4.6 says, Be careful for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Colossians 4.2 says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. This is not the sermon today, but I'll tell you this, that as thankfulness has become a bigger and bigger part of my personal prayer life, when I have prayer meetings, we're mostly just praying for needs. But when I'm at home praying, almost exclusively, I start with Thanksgiving. You hear me do it here at church. That's how I pray at home. But I'll tell you, when I'm at home praying, sometimes I never get out of it, the Thanksgiving part. I never get to my list. Because when I start, because when I start thinking, about how good God's been to me. That's all I want to talk to him about. And that's it. And the other things that were on my list to ask for, I just, I don't have time for them because I've been too busy being thankful. And you know what? God knew it was on my prayer list before I read it to him. And I 100% uh, have seen God answer prayers that I wrote down and barely ever got to praying for. And I think some of it's because I was just so thankful that God looked over my shoulder, saw the list, and said, I'm just going to do that one. I don't think that's weird. I basically do that to Hugo sometimes. Sometimes he's just being so sweet to his sister and so good to his mama. I know what that kid wants. I'll just, boom, done. Right? God's a better father than I am. 
Let's talk about the foundation of how we get to this. And this is the text we just read, and I won't uh, belabor it here this morning. It's a very deep text anyway. We couldn't do it, not with two hours. Don't tempt me. (laughs) The foundation here of thankfulness, the reason I believe that thankfulness is so important, is that what we are after is not just saying, well, we ought to be thankful because it's better. And it's not that we should just not be unthankful because it's dangerous. Fine, that's all true. But my, I think God's burden for us, and my burden I would say to you, is not just that you would not do something dangerous and you would do something good. It's this, that you would have a life that means something. God wants you to have a life that's not just a comfortable one. He wants you to have one that matters. A life that, that mattered, that it meant something. And the meaningful stuff almost never comes from the easy stuff. Almost never. So what do you want? Do you want a life that was just easy and comfortable and didn't make a difference to anybody and never mattered or changed anything? Or do you want a life that meant something, that mattered, that made a difference? Thankfulness is going to be a part of that. Here's, I just, we're going to break down those verses we just read and we'll do it quickly. I just want to say this. That treasure in jars of clay is a challenge to us about whose power do you want The Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels, in jars of clay, that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. Some people are so full of themselves that there's no room for the power of God. If you want to fill a cup with something, the first step is empty out what was already in there. And I know it's painful. I know it's painful to have more of ourselves drained out. But that is necessary to make room that the power of God might come in. There's treasure that God is willing to store in a jar of clay like you and me. Life is going to be hard. There is no escape from it. So, do you want to manage it and your own power and wisdom? Or would you like to have God as your partner? Now the devil says, don't take God as your partner. God will not save you from trouble, confusion, persecution, or loss. And that's true. The best lies are mostly true. The devil says, don't take God as your partner. He won't save you from any of that stuff. Do you know who else won't save you from any of that stuff? Satan's not going to help. I mean, you can try to say, and you say, okay, well, I'm not going to do either. I'll just do myself. How is saving yourself from all that going? Okay. So it seems inescapable then, doesn't it? God could stop those things, but he doesn't. Not usually. Here's the deal that God offers. I'll be with you. I'll go with you. He'll put, that, he'll put that treasure, his own presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit of God inside a jar of dirt. You don't have to be amazing. You have to clean yourself up. You don't have to be some spectacular thing for God to say, hey, I'll partner with you. When you think about who would God get in a partnership with? Jars of clay is the answer. With Jesus, there's still trouble but we're saved from distress. With Jesus, there's still confusion, but we're saved from despair. With Jesus, there's still persecution, but you're never forsaken. With Jesus, we're sometimes cast down, but never destroyed. These verses talk about following Jesus. In verse 10, it says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Here's the thing about following Jesus. It's death first and then life. People say, hey, I want that resurrection stuff. I just don't want to die. Well, I got bad news. There has never yet been a resurrection where there wasn't a death first. That's it. You want, I want God's resurrection power. Okay. 
Step one? Step one's a cross. Step two's three days thinking it's all over. Three days thinking there's no coming back. Oh, but day three. Day three is resurrection power. Now, sometimes it's more than three days. How many of you know that's true? Yeah. Say, oh, well, it was three days. I could muscle it out for that long. But as you're trying to muscle it out, you're doing it wrong. You haven't given up. You've not died yet. As long as it's still you are going to hang in there, you are going to do it. I am embarrassed to tell you how many years I just thought with Evangeline and with the problems that we have in my marriage that I just thought, I'm going to grit it out. I'm going to tough it out. We're going to make it through. I'm going to do it. I can hang in there. I can make it. I, 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 I. And it wasn't until the death of I that there was resurrection power. If you're going to follow Jesus, you need to understand it's death first. And then the life comes. And that's our lives too. Verse 14, knowing that he that raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. The cross is a tool of execution. It's a symbol of death. But as we bear our cross and follow Jesus, we also get to participate in the life of Jesus. The cross is not the end. Death is not the end. Victory waits on the other side. Life waits on the other side. Things are hard, but with Jesus, with Jesus, the end of the story is life and victory. These verses also tell us about the bigger picture for a meaningful life. For all things, our verse says in verse 15, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Here's the bigger picture. Christian, it's grace leading to eternal victory. It's the grace of God, the grace of God, all through our lives, along every step of the way, the grace of God. And at the end, it's eternal glory. For our light affliction, verse 17, is but for a moment. And it worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The affliction doesn't seem light. And it seems longer than a moment. But when we step across the river, when this life is done. And you see what God was able to do through affliction. You're going to say. It's so glorious that that affliction was barely anything and it only lasted a minute. So the triumph of Thanksgiving is this message. It has four parts. We're going to do two today. And they are going to go pretty quickly because I believe you know these stories. I'll summarize them quickly if you don't. But I want you to see this morning how Thanksgiving helps us triumph over fear. Thanksgiving has helped me triumph in my life over fear. And I want to share a little bit about that. Secondly, Thanksgiving helps us triumph over despair. And God has used Thanksgiving in my life to help get victory over despair. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about how Thanksgiving helps us triumph over trials. Right when we're in the middle of them. And how Thanksgiving helps us triumph over things that are temporary. Life is temporary. And Thanksgiving helps you get victory over things that are temporary. That's next Sunday. Today, let's talk about the triumph of thanksgiving over fear. This is in Daniel chapter 6, and the meatballs are almost ready. The people in children's ministry are also almost cooked. I, I have the verses all here, but if you'll bear with me this morning, I'd like to do this. I'd like to just kind of tell you the story of Daniel a little bit for those of you that maybe don't know. And we're just going to kind of skip right to the application. But I, I want to encourage you, Daniel chapter 6, go read the whole thing. The story of Daniel and the lion's den. Here's how the story starts in the first three verses. It starts with the promotion of Daniel. Daniel's kind of a big deal. He's carried away as a young man into Babylon and then through successive empires as, as Babylon keeps getting conquered by new people and at this point the Persians are, are in charge, they, Daniel keeps rising to the top. 
Whoever the king is, they want Daniel to be their, to be their key advisor. At Daniel 5.11, it's in your outline. When, uh, when Darius is looking for somebody to help him figure out a problem, the handwriting's on the wall, if you will. Daniel 5.11, it says, There's a man thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him. Yeah, like the wisdom of the gods. You know what that was? This is the wisdom of God. But even the pagans are like, there's something about this Daniel guy. And so Daniel again rises to power. Darius the Mede promotes him to be second in command in the whole kingdom. But this prompts jealousy among the other advisors. We find then in verses 4 through 7, the unjust conspiracy against Daniel. You can read it in verse 4. It says, the, the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel. But they couldn't find any fault in him. They, they studied, the, how can we get him? How can we get rid of him? They couldn't find anything wrong with him. And so they finally say, the only way we're going to get him is if it's going to be something against his God. How wonderful is that? Can you imagine? Well, I mean, what a great testimony. If somebody were to say about me or to say about you, the only way we're going to convict them is if we make something about Christianity illegal. Wouldn't that be great if the only thing they could put you in jail for was being a Christian? Oh, that's kind of my goal. I like that. I mean, not jail necessarily. I just, all right. But listen, why do they hate Daniel? If he's not doing anything wrong, why do they hate him? Because they hate God. Jesus said it, verse John 15 in your outline. Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. I want you to see, so they make a law, the conspiracy. Let me, so the conspiracy against Daniel is this. If anyone prays to any God besides King Darius, who's not a God, if anybody prays to anybody besides Darius, they're going to throw him in a den of lions. And they know they've got Daniel because they know Daniel three times a day in public is out praying. So they will just make that illegal. And if anybody breaks the law, we'll throw him to the lions. And Darius foolishly signs this law. The law of the Medes and Persians cannot be changed once it's written. So they sign the law. Daniel <laughs> realizes this is a real threat. I want you to see the reality of this threat. Lions are super scary. May I say this? Many of our fears are perfectly reasonable and perfectly rational. Sometimes I've heard preaching where people talk about, hey, Christian, you should not be afraid. Don't be afraid. The Bible does say that. Don't be afraid. Fear not. I am with thee, right? It's one of the first Bible verses I've read. Hugo Learn. Fear not. Be of good courage. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go, right? It's good. We know that. Boom. But sometimes the way that we process that, sometimes the way that we get taught that or somehow it internalizes it, is that if we're afraid, there's something wrong with us. May I just say, if you're never afraid, something's wrong with you. Lots of the things we're afraid of are reasonable. Daniel has a conspiracy of the most powerful men in the kingdom out to get him. They have made it illegal to pray. And the penalty for it is to get fed to a lion. Not in my top five ways I want to die. Fears are realities. The psalm of Psalm 31, I've heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. Well, they took counsel together against me. They devised to take away my life. It's not just Daniel. It's not just David. This is a threat that we face. Many of the things that you are afraid of, that I'm afraid of, are very real things. Many of the things that I'm afraid of in my life are very real things. Things are wrong with my kid's heart. Cancer's scary. There's real things to be afraid of. And I don't think I'm crazy to be afraid of them. So what's Daniel going to do? We find the answer in verse 10. The answer is a triumph. 
Let me read it to you, verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, the law of the Medes and Persians, which changes not, there's no escape from it now. If he prays to God, they're going to feed him to the lions. So what did he do? Verse 10. When Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went to his house, his windows being open in his chamber towards Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. When he knew this is not a theoretical fear. It was not like, oh, if people see me praying, maybe they won't like me. Maybe something bad will happen. Maybe I'll upset somebody. Maybe, maybe. No. When he knew, pushed the windows of his living room open. Because that's how he always did it. And he gave thanks. He gave thanks. Thanks. Not, God, why would you let this happen? God, why these wicked men? God, I'm trying to be faithful. God, what about the lions? God, can't you hear me from the closet? How about, God, I just pray inside my head? You can pray inside your head. You can pray in your closet. Why is he doing this out in the open? Because that's what he always does. Because that's what he always does. The triumph here is consistent thankfulness. He was not going to allow a change in his circumstances to change his practice of gratitude. He had built habits of thankfulness and lions were not going to change it. Fear was not going to change his pattern of thankfulness. First Thessalonians says, see that no one render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, I'm not sure we can give thanks for everything. Now, you can try. That's, you could do that. But I recommend you start here. In everything, give thanks. You may not be ready to go, God, thank you for the lions and this terrible persecution. But even in that situation, there are things to be thankful for. And just because something bad has changed over here, doesn't mean the good things all went away. Doesn't mean those past blessings never happened. Doesn't mean heaven's still not your home. Doesn't mean God's still not your father. There's so many things to still be thankful for, even though this thing has gone super, super wrong. There's still things to be thankful for. If we don't fixate on the one thing that's not, or the 10 things that are not, or the 20 things that are not. It doesn't change the other things. What's controlling your behavior? The end of the story, you probably know. The end of this story of Daniel is deliverance and glory to God. As God often seems to do, God does not deliver Daniel from going into the lion's den. Seems like that would have been the easier option. Remember, persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. We see it vividly lived out in Daniel's life. He is cast down into the den of lions. He is persecuted, but he's not forsaken. And he's not destroyed. God sends an angel, shuts the mouths of the lions. Daniel spends, he sleeps. King, go read it. Chapter six. Daniel in the den, surrounded by hungry lions, gets a better night of rest than the king in his palace. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. He goes down there. You think, well, maybe the lions weren't hungry. No. The conspirators, they feed them the next day to the lions. The lions, the Bible says, ate them before they hit the ground. Oof. That's another sermon. The end of the story is deliverance and God gets the glory. I want you to see, I just, the very end of it, Darius, after this deliverance, Darius writes a decree unto all peoples, nations, and languages. This is the world empire at the time. He, here's what Darius wrote. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree in every dominion of my kingdom. Men should tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. 
for he is the living God, steadfast forever. His is the kingdom that shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall be to the very end. He delivereth and rescueth. He worketh signs and wonders in heaven and earth. He hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. For a guy that was mandating people only pray to him a week before, that's a pretty good turnaround. And it says, so Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Daniel prospers. What's that mean? We're troubled on every side, but not distressed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. That the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Look, there it is, lived out in the life of Daniel. His thanksgiving resulted in great glory to God and then prosperity for him. Here's the application, the first part of this message this morning. Thankfulness flows out of your heart, not from your circumstances. If you could take a lesson from Daniel this morning, I would challenge you to take this away from him. If you're waiting for your circumstances to make you thankful, that's a bad mistake. Daniel was thankful when his circumstances were good, and he was thankful when his circumstances were fatally dire. Why? Because the thankfulness wasn't, oh, thank you, God, everything's going well in my life. I mean, if everything's going well in your life, you might think about thanking God for that. But that's, thankfulness does not come out of your circumstances. Thankfulness comes out of your heart. People say, well, I'd be thankful if I had, if that was going well, or if I had that, or if I had the other thing. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. If you're not thankful now, you won't be thankful then. And not only that, but thankfulness will help us defeat the fear of our circumstances. Not only does thankfulness really flow from the heart, but I want to challenge you this morning. If you will really build thankfulness into your heart, if you will really make a practice like Daniel, of just giving thanks, of just being grateful, of just saying, thank you, God. When your circumstances do change, when the bad news comes, when the hard things happen, just like Daniel, thankfulness will help you defeat that fear. Proverbs 4.23 says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. I want to show you a picture and then I'm moving on. This is the waiting room outside the intensive care unit in Sacred Heart at this children's hospital. That's why it's colorful. And I've spent quite a bit of time there. I've spent quite a bit of time there. The rooms, there's a closet really that you can sleep in that's just around the corner from this space for those parents that won't leave. Some of the hardest moments of my life. That's the backdrop for him. And uh, it was there, and I, I just, I didn't want to read my Bible. I just couldn't. I remember my mom brought my Bible to the hospital. I was so mad. I was so mad. If God wants me to read my Bible, he can send me and my kid home. <laughs> I'll read it there. But eventually, uh, I remember, uh, I think it was my mom also, brought me a hymnal. And something real wonderful happened. And I remember to start thanking God, to start praising him. It's a long story, but I want to tell you that what's changed from there to now is that now, even as we get in the car to go to the hospital with Evangeline, when something's going real wrong and we're not sure if this is it, because one day it's going to be. All the kids with Evangeline's conditions, when they die, the story always starts the same. They got real sick, went to the hospital, they died. And so over and over, the people in our community whose kids have the same issues as Evangeline, over and over, this is the story. And we know that one day that's going to be our story. That day's coming. 
And so every time we're loading her into the car to go to the hospital, I'm always thinking, maybe this is the one. And so, so now what we do as we put her in the car, we start making the lists of things we're grateful for. Literally, as we're driving to the hospital, Heather and I are talking back and forth to each other about, you know what? Boy, isn't that a blessing. Boy, isn't this good news? And I'm still freaked out. And it's not just happy talk. We're talking turkey too. But along with dealing with the reality and processing through it, we're just stirring a little gratitude. Just sprinkle some of that thankfulness on top of it. And I'm telling you, there's victories that happen. While we're waiting in the ER, while we're waiting for the doctors, while it's all falling apart, we're reminding ourselves of how much we have to be grateful for, of what a blessed people we are, about how good God has been to us, how good God has been to Evangeline, how much he loves us. And there's victory over fear that can come when you choose thankfulness. Finally, the triumph of thanksgiving over despair. This one's a little bit rougher even, but I felt it was important to put along with it because in my life, there's the fears that come on me from the external things, the wicked people or disease or loss or grief and those external things that come in. I've personally found it harder even to deal with the ones that come from inside. The ones where I'm in the trouble I'm in because I done messed up. I look at the problems and I think, I did this. And the result of that is not fear exactly, it's hopelessness. There's a special kind of grief. Sometimes we just call it despair. Jonah is such a good illustration of it, chapters 1 and 2. Again, I don't have time to do it. Many of you are familiar with it. I'll just remind you the story quickly as we go. It begins the first three verses, verses of Jonah. We read about Jonah's rebellion. God says, Jonah, I want you to go. So Jonah goes the other direction. God says, I want you to go inland and northeast. Jonah catches a boat going south or west. Yeah. Not only, I mean, he should have gotten a donkey and instead he got on a boat. I mean, he's going about as opposite as, as he possibly can from what God said. Isaiah 53. All we, like sheep, have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way. It's not just Jonah. It's also me. It's also me. But we see then the consequences of running away from God. Who would have thunk that running away from God might not work out super great. <laughs> Turns out, not super great. He gets on a boat going the wrong direction, and the verse 4 says, the Lord sent a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest, so that the ship was likely to be broken. That phrasing has always stuck in my mind. That the ship was likely to be broken. <laughs> Doesn't that sound just about right sometimes? The storm's gotten so much, it feels like the most likely outcome is that I'm irretrievably, that I'm irretrievably broken. It's a fearful thing because we watch it unfold all the time around us. Galatians 6 says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth through his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. You'll hear people today talk about karma or what goes around, comes around, or what's that. Those are just the wrong, bad names for what the Bible says. The Bible says, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. That's true. It's an immutable law of the universe. God is not mocked. If you sow corn, you grow corn. If you sow wheat, you grow wheat. If you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. That's how it works. And so, we spend our lives sowing things. And then when it starts to grow, there can be despair. 
It doesn't stop there. Through the rest of chapter 1, we find the downward spiral of it. How many of you know that that's true? It's not like when you've done something wrong and now the consequences start to unfold, now the chickens start to come home to roost. It's not like you just get popped once and now you're done, right, is it? It's not like, oh, okay, that hurt. I learned my lesson. For the big ones, for the big ones, they spiral. I talk to Hugo about this all the time. I say, Hugo. Because like he doesn't like it when we have to discipline him, when we, you know, do something really terrible like no screen time. Whew. Painful. <laughs> if you don't have kids, you don't get that joke. But all, all the parents are like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> when we, no screen time hurts us worse than it hurts him. But when we, when we have to lay out some consequence, I talk to him. I say, buddy, listen. This is going to hurt for a minute, and then it's going to be all over. And daddy wants you to learn about consequences because I will lift these. If you don't learn about actions and consequences, when you get older... You're going to do actions, and those consequences will not be merciful. Those consequences will not have pity on you. Those consequences will not say, oh, you've suffered enough. You are released. And I tell him, I don't. I don't want you to end up on the downward spiral. Or sometimes it starts to accumulate, doesn't it? It starts to pile up and pile up. And Jonah does this, he, it's, it's kind of incredible to read it. He finally admits that it's his fault that they're in this storm, that they're about to die. And he says, it's because I serve God. He says, it's because I serve God and I'm running away from him. He says that to the sailors on the boat. He says, the reason we're about to die is because I'm a servant of God, I'm his prophet, but I'm running away from him instead of obeying him. They say, what should we do? What is the obvious answer to that question? Well, okay, God, I will obey now. Right? Duh. Turn the boat around. I'm supposed to be going that way. No. That's not what he says. He says, this is my fault that we're in this predicament. I know what you should do. Just throw me into the ocean. It used to baffle me. Until my own downward spiral of despair. It happened in my marriage. It was just too hard. And I was doing a lot of the wrong things. And I was just more and more distant from my wife, who was so patient with me and so long-suffering and so kind. And I was just pulling further and further away. And, just... and, and my solution was not, oh, dummy, go make it right with your wife. Or maybe start by getting right with Jesus, right? My solution was I was going to get in a car and move to Canada. No problems in Canada. Just a land flowing with maple syrup. And... There's something about the downward spiral of despair. It breaks our brains. And it's just because I just felt so low and rotten, but wasn't really ready to accept responsibility, not really ready to change anything. So I just felt worse and worse. And the worse I felt, the more it made me feel bad. I'd come to church and hear the things. I'd be, I, I know I ought to do that. But hearing those things I knew I ought to do only made me feel worse. I didn't really want to do them yet. And that made me just feel even worse about myself. And you get it. Down and down we go. And Jonah, of course, has this experience. They, they finally, the sailors beg him. They throw everything overboard ahead of Jonah. They try not to do it. But finally, Jonah's left him no choice. He won't get right with God. So they do what he says, and they throw him in the ocean, and down he goes. But it's not over yet. Now the whale comes along <laughs> and swallows him up and takes him down even deeper. In chapter 2, Jonah finally remembers. He remembers something really important. He remembers that God is good. And he remembers that God hears. 
Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. It took him three days for the prophet to think, maybe I should pray. That has made me feel a lot better. I just want you to hear Jonah's prayer. Jonah said, I cried by reason of my affliction of the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. They said, I, then I said, I'm cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again towards thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depths closed me round about. The weeds wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came into thee, into thy holy temple. I mean, if you're in the depths of despair, that's a good prayer. And I want you to, now, the end of Jonah's story, I want you to hear the triumph. Like, so Daniel's a good example. <laughs> and here all the fear comes in him and he just consistently keeps giving thanksgiving. Jonah has kind of a different experience. <laughs> Runs away from God. The consequences of his actions begin to stack up. He thinks maybe he's abandoned and deserves to be. But he remembers that God's good. He remembers that God can hear him. No matter how much Jonah has messed up, no matter how far he's run from God, no matter how low he has gone, he remembers that God can hear him. And when he begins to turn around, he repents and gives thanks. Verse 9. So Jonah says, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. That's his turnaround verse. And it's interesting. It's got two parts to it. He says, I'm going to do what I said I would do, God. When I became a prophet, I said I would obey your voice and give your message to the people. I'm actually going to do what I said I would do. He's going to repent. Instead of running away, God, I'm going to turn around. Good. Only took a terrible storm and three days in the whale's stomach. But hey, he got there. He got there. He said, okay, 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 I'll do it. But apart, but immediately preceding him deciding to get right with God, it says, I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. There's something about thanksgiving that actually springs you out of despair. And the end of the story, I just want you to know, is forgiveness and a second chance. The next, very next verse after Daniel said, or after, after Jonah says, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. Verse 10, the Lord spake unto the fish and it vomited Jonah up on the dry land. I mean, he came out stinky, but, but he came out, but he came out. Take two, Jonah. The end of the story is forgiveness in a second chance. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is the story of the prodigal son. One of the final verses of it's in your outline, Luke 15, 20. The prodigal son, as you know, insults his father, tells him basically he wishes his father was dead, wants his inheritance now, takes it, goes away into a far country, blows it all on riotous living, the Bible says. Finally ends up so hungry, abandoned by all his so-called friends, feeding the pigs, jealous of what the pigs are eating because the pigs are doing better than he is. And he finally says, you know, I'm going to, he finally hits the bottom. He finally says, you know, I'm going to rise. I'm going to go to my father. I'm going to say, hey, dad, I know, I know. I don't deserve to be your son anymore. I said, I wish you were dead. I get it. But could I be your servant? 
because he's remembered something about his father. He's remembered that his father's good. His father treats his servants better than he has been treating himself. He remembers that his father will hear him and that his father's good. So he decides to go back and ask to be a servant. And if you know the story, his father has been waiting for him to come back. His father's been waiting for him. And when he sees him, he sees him yet a long ways off. It's not just like waiting, like casually waiting. His dad's been scanning the horizons, waiting. And when he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. He saw what a mess his son had become. But he's not put off. He doesn't say, wow, you've really messed it all up. Wow, you've wasted so many years. I mean, what's happened to you? No. Compassion. And his father ran. Which if you don't know Middle Eastern culture, very undignified but very tender. He ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Jesus told us this story so that we would know about what he is like. And I'd like to end the sermon by saying this. The second application on thankfulness from this story is I want you, church family, to remember. I want you to remember who God is and his great blessings. Remember that God treats his servants better than the devil treats his friends. God treats his servants better than we treat ourselves. And if you come to God and you say, God, I just, I don't even need to be your son. I know I've blown it, but you just take me in as a servant. Because it's better to be a servant in your house than king somewhere else. It is. That's just true. If you remember God's great blessings, if you remember who God is, if you remember what he's like, if you come and you say, I think I'll just go try crawling back to God. I wonder if God will have me. If I come crawling back to him, all mangled and messed up, and I've wasted the fortune, I've squandered everything. I wonder, I wonder if you'll take me back. I want you to know that Jesus said the Father was watching the horizons for you to come back. And he runs. And he runs. And may I give you some advice? Don't just go crawling back to God. When it comes necessary for you to go crawling back to God, <laughs> run. Just run. Crawl if that's the only thing you can do. How do we practically do that? I want to challenge you to keep track of God's blessings so that you can defeat the rising despair. Because as you spiral down in the whale, it's probably true. When I spiraled down to the depths and I was thinking about all the reasons why I was kind of a piece of dirt, this was just true. Those are just true things. Heather doesn't always enjoy it when I talk about that this period in her life. She says I'm too hard on myself or whatever. And she said, oh, well, you know, whatever, whatever. But, but I just say to her, well, it's true. You ever had somebody try to encourage you, you know, when you're like feeling bad about something? Something's gone really wrong. You failed at something. And people are like, oh, no, it's not that bad. And you're like, Mrah. I don't think you're listening to my story. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The problem is you're not going to get out of that spiral of despair by just looking at what's true. Because what's true might be that you've been swallowed by a whale and you're down at the bottom. So how do we get out of it? I really genuinely believe this. It begins when you begin to keep track of God's blessings. This is my gratitude journal. It sits on my desk. It almost never leaves my desk. It's got a picture of a whale on it. Oh, man. <laughs> and in there, it's page after page of things I'm grateful for. Pages of it. Big ones. Not just small blessings. I mean, there's some in there that maybe you would call small, but everything that gets written down in there, to me, are very big blessings. Giant answers to prayer. 
impossible situations that God resolved. Victories that God has delivered. Things that I could never earn. Things I could never pay God back for. Page after page of them. I've been at it for years now. Every year I probably only write 10, maybe 15 things, and I'm a terrible journaler. But every year I add just a couple handfuls of things. But after a dozen or so years of doing it now, now I got pages. Because I'm prone to forget when I'm in the belly of the whale. And so because I've been keeping track, I, when I'm feeling like nobody loves me, everybody hates me, and they're all correct to do both of those things. I get out my book and I read it. And I remember how good God is. I remember how great his blessings are. And I start to give thanks. And then I get vomited up on the beach. <laughs> it's good. After you're puked up, there's often still work to go do. I got apologies to go make now. But really the restoration, I, I tell you, God's done such a miracle in our marriage now. Heather's just my best friend and she, her name comes up a lot in my gratitude journal. I'm so grateful for her. And she's such a blessing to my, in my life. And... Uh, <laughs> I never went to Canada. <laughs> but it started coming up out of the belly of despair that we existed, that I existed in in my marriage for years, for years. I'm not mad at Jonah for spending three days because I spent years living with like the best person and not appreciating it. But the revival started when I started being thankful. That's when this journal started. It was down in the depths. Not when I was on the mountaintop, down in the depths. If you're in the depths, start making a list of things you're thankful for. If you're not, insurance policy. Start making the list now. You'll have a head start for when the whale comes. Sister, if you're able to come and play and I, I don't have too much to say here at the end, really, other than um, our, our theme this year has been connecting to God by listening and by talking and by being in partnership with God. And what might God want to say to you this morning? I believe that Jesus would like to talk to you. I'm confident of it. Would you use the moment of quietness here that's about to come to listen to what Jesus might want to say? If you're in despair, listen, if you're here this morning, you're watching the live stream and you're in despair. The Bible says that, and I would just like to say amen from my own personal experience. You can always go home. You can always go home. And the first step might be just to remember how good God is. <laughs> Start making a list. Maybe you're here this morning, you're dealing with fear. <laughs> There's scary things lurking in your family. There's scary things on your horizon. You can choose thankfulness. It really will help you defeat the fear. Maybe it's something else. Whatever it is God wants to talk to you about. You talk to him right now.